Good evening, or if you're joining us online from elsewhere in the world, perhaps good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to Reading Architecture Writing. This is a lecture series at Kyoto University in which authors introduce their new books on topics usually related to Japanese architecture and urbanism. So it's a pleasure to introduce Alec Navala Lee, uh, an unusual speaker in the series in that he's not an architect, he's not even really a historian, he's certainly not a professional historian, but he's in fact a widely published and highly regarded science fiction author. Today he's going to discuss his non-fiction book, Inventor of the Future, The Visionary Life of Buckminster Fuller. It's the first comprehensive biography of Fuller. It's a New York Times book review editor's choice. His previous book was titled Astounding, John W. Campbell, Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, L. Ron Hubbard, and the Golden Age of Science Fiction. It was a Hugo Award finalist. It was named one of the best books of the year by The Economist magazine. He's published three novels with Penguin, including one titled The Icon Thief, and uh, his work has appeared in The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, Slate, Salon, Analog Science Fiction and Fact, and The Daily Beast. So the topic tonight is Buckminster Fuller, undoubtedly one of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century. As an architectural designer, inventor, and futurist, Fuller uh, entertained a vast popular audience. He inspired devotion from both the counterculture and the establishment, and he was praised as a kind of modern Leonardo da Vinci. We immediately associate his name with geodesic domes, as well as with 10 sacred structures, but perhaps more importantly, he was one of the first public intellectuals to really talk about um, environmentalism and ecology, about sustainability, about the efficient use of materials and energy. So using a design strategy based on geometric principles, he became convinced that it was possible to provide for all of humanity through the efficient use of planetary resources, which he expressed in the image or metaphor of spaceship Earth. And Fuller's legacy endures to today in his uh, belief uh, and the transformative potential of technology has profoundly influenced the founders of Silicon Valley. Alec is going to discuss Fuller's career, his lessons for designers, for activists and innovators, which remain as powerful and essential as ever. But Mr. Fuller was famous for giving lectures that would last for hours and hours, if not days, but we're going to be more efficient with our time resources. This is intended to be a very interactive presentation, so feel free to interrupt at any time a question or a comment or a, a criticism of what's being said. Over to you, Alec. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, I really appreciate that introduction um, and uh, the invitation to speak here uh, tonight. Uh, it's actually 3.30 a.m. Uh, in the morning on my end, um, which uh, you know gives you a sense of the, the time difference. I, I'm based in Chicago, Illinois, in the U.S., um, but I, I was very eager to speak to this, uh, this audience. Um, I don't often have a chance to speak to people who are architects or uh, involved on the uh, the academic side. And I think Fuller is clearly um, uh, just a, a fascinating and instructive figure, uh, you know, for, for people in, in that community. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so thanks again for uh, asking me to be here. And, and I look forward to, you know, answering questions and uh, discussing a little bit further after, after I show you a few pictures. Um, so uh, let me let me switch to screen sharing so I can show you a few things that um, I prepared for tonight. So um, so this is my book, <laughs> Inventor of the Future, uh, which was released in August. And um, uh, so, so I should start by saying that, you know, Fuller during his lifetime was um, one of the most famous men in the world. Uh, you know, he was on the cover of Time magazine. He lectured um, in many countries, many, many schools. Um, he was uh, awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by, by Ronald Reagan. And, you know, for, for a lot of Americans especially, uh, you know, he was uh, the most famous futurist uh, alive. Um, you know, he, he kind of embodied the future for people in ways that um, I think are really extraordinary. Um, and, uh, you know, he was, um, you know, perhaps most surprisingly an icon to young people, uh, to the counterculture. 
Um, you look at his uh, influence and you can see it in Silicon Valley, in the design world, um, you know, especially in the late 60s and early 70s, you know, when people were looking for for certain ideas and, and Fuller, you know, um, embodied these ideas for um, a huge number of, of listeners and readers. And he, he has kind of fallen out of the conversation uh, since then. And, you know, I've often been asked why or, or you know, what I think happened. And, and I think one factor was the lack of a really strong biography of Fuller that would place his career in context and use the primary sources and interviews with people who worked with him to kind of build out a more nuanced picture. Fuller is often depicted as a sort of idealized genius, as this benevolent uh, older figure um, who, you know, the... the um, what I what I soon discovered when I wrote this book is that, um, you know, that's only part of the story. Uh, Fuller was actually a very complex man, uh, very ambitious, very driven. I mean, genius, a genius in my opinion, but um, you know, someone who was difficult to work with, who could be hard on his students, his colleagues, who often took credit for ideas that you know were not entirely his, um, and sometimes embellished aspects of his personal life. Um, so, uh, to to kind of bring out his complexity. Uh, to me was important because I do see him uh, still as an incredible role model um, and, and as someone who, uh, you know, has a lot to tell us, you know, regardless of what field, you know, we, we happen to be in. Um, so I was speaking to uh, Stuart Cowan, uh, who is the current head of um, the Buckminster Fuller Institute. Uh, and he asked me, you know, how would I explain Fuller's significance to people who might not have, you know, who might not be familiar with his work? And, and I said, there, there are really three things about Fuller that I try to underline. Um, one is his, uh, for better, for lack of a better word, his persona. You know, I think Fuller was in many ways the prototype of the startup founder. Uh, you know, the strategies that he used to start projects and, and get things done, you know, to me anticipate and in some ways influence, um, you know, some of the exact same um, the, the language and the and the images and the approaches that um, Silicon Valley has used that startup founders um, and and tech figures still use today. And, and so I think Fuller is an incredibly interesting case study, you know, and how that kind of uh, story is told. Uh, the second aspect of Fuller that I find interesting uh, is his geometry, which we'll be discussing a little bit further, uh, which I think actually has a lot of interesting applications and potential for you know, design and architecture and even the sciences. And, and the last is, you know, you know his, his concepts um, about design. And, you know, the central one here is ephemeralization, uh, which is a, a term that Fuller or people in his circle coined, I would say, in the early 30s. Um, and it means, in some ways, doing more with less, you know, doing uh, more with uh, more efficient materials. Uh, and also this idea that technology progresses from, um, in Fuller's view, uh, compression structures like concrete through tension structures, uh, through visual, uh, and finally, uh, the abstract. Which I think is like a trend that we've we've seen, you know, certainly in my lifetime, um, you know, come through very clearly. And I think Fuller was talking about this, um, what I think is a very powerful concept, uh, you know, as early as the late twenties. Um, but the one thing, you know, I, I like to start with uh, is an image that, um, to me, kind of encapsulates all of this. This is the, the image here. Uh, I mean, many of you probably recognize this as um, the ride, a spaceship Earth at Epcot Center in Walt Disney World in Florida. Um, so, uh, Spaceship Earth, I think, is interesting because, you know, this is a, a famous, um, it's, it's, it's a cultural touchstone, you know, it, it's, it's recognizable to everyone, and it's really based on Fuller's ideas, you know, it was first built in 1982, uh, and it was in development since the mid-70s. Um, and clearly, you know, it is a geodesic sphere, which, you know, resembles many of the structures that Fuller uh, was, was known for during his lifetime. Um, it's called Spaceship Earth, which is a uh, metaphor that Fuller often used. Uh, so, and, you know, and, and it was meant to be the centerpiece of a park uh, called Future World. You know, this is, um, you know, when the Disney Imagineers uh, were trying to think of a, an, an image in the early, in the mid 70s, early 80s that would convey the future to people. You know, the best thing they could do was to find a iconic object that, uh, you know, was clearly rooted in Fuller's ideas. So that that's interesting to me. Uh, the other thing that is interesting that I will, you know, kind of maybe touch on later on is that Fuller was not involved at all with uh, Spaceship Earth at Epcot Center. Uh, he was not even informed of this project until he learned about it uh, by chance. 
So, you know, th this to me is, is, um, interesting for two reasons. One is that it reflects, you know, Fuller's stature. Uh, you know, he was so famous at that point that the Disney Imagineers felt that they could treat his ideas as if they were essentially in the public domain. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that speaks to his cultural omnipresence at that point in history. Um, and the other issue is that, you know, he wasn't involved. Uh, in some ways, he had become, um, you know, uh, less powerful as an architect or as an architectural designer at that stage, more powerful as a public figure. Um, he was not someone that the Disney Imagineers would have um, wanted to work with necessarily. Um, and, uh, you know, he was not an architect, right? You know, he, he um, lacked the technical ability to realize these projects. Um, he relied on collaborators. And he tended to take credit for buildings that other people had designed. So I think if you were an Imagineer, you know, this is not someone you need to have on your team um, or, you know, you will benefit from having on your team. Um, it's much easier to simply take the idea that he embodied and sort of appropriate it for yourself, um, which is what Disney did. So it speaks to his, you know, uh, importance, but also his complexity. You know, he, he was not... Um, you know, as I say, you know, he was not an architect, and yet um, he was routinely called upon to um, advise or at least to uh, provide his, his perspective on massive architectural questions and projects. Um, so one of the biggest ones is, uh, is this. This is um, a rendering of a project called Tetrahedron City, uh, which Fuller um, uh, envisioned in um, the mid-60s. Uh, from Matsu Taro Shoriki, the uh, owner of the Yomiuri Giants, um, who, again, the two men had an interesting relationship. Fuller actually has a very long history in Japan, which I can touch on in the Q&A session if people like. Um, but, you know, this is an incredible megastructure. It was supposed to be a, a pyramid two miles high, you know, that could house, um, you know, millions of people or thousands of people. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's very striking, you know, this, this image has been criticized, and I think rightly so for being um, almost alienating, like, like a monolithic structure, right? And, and, you know, while we could talk about its aesthetic or its practical uh, attributes, you know, I, I'm most interested in the idea that, you know, someone would commission Fuller to um, even uh, conceive of a project like this because as i said you know fuller was not an architect you know he was um he was not someone who in any world could have realized uh you know this um uh this plan uh for real but he was you know called upon to um imagine it for people and, and what i want to talk about in this uh talk uh is is why you know why did fuller become this figure um who you know it was trusted and embodied so many uh, of these ideas for so many people. So um, I can start, you know, by going pretty far back. Uh, so this, the picture that I have here is of Fuller um, around 1930. Um, so Fuller was born in 1895, all right, which you know, you know gives you a sense of of the time frame here. Uh, he died in 1983, and you know he did not uh, emerge as sort of anything like the figure that we we know now until he was, um, I would say in his early thirties. Um, so up until that point, you know, he, I, I, you know, you can, you can read the book if you want more information about his, his earlier life, but you know, the, the short version is that he was born into a, a privileged family in new England uh, that was well off and not rich. Um, he went to Harvard, but was asked to withdraw twice uh, for reasons that had had to do with his academic performance and, and some other issues. Um, and uh, I know after several early jobs, he, he went to work for his father-in-law, uh, James Hewlett, um, for a company called Stockade, which they founded, which um, uh, had invented this kind of fibrous brick that could be um, used to set concrete and, and kind of produce, uh, you know, buildings uh, that otherwise would have been made out of out of brick or or um, or masonry more efficiently. Uh, this company fails, uh, or at least Fuller is driven out of the company uh, in, Ch in Chicago in 1927. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's bitter about the experience, um, and he famously has an epiphany, um, he says, by the shores of Lake Michigan, that inspire him to devote, devote his life to, um, you know, I, you would say the, the, the advancement of humanity or, you know, to the, the um, improvement of lives of all men. Um, and, you know, he, he, does, he does emerge around this point as, uh, you know, someone who starts to look familiar. 
uh, at least to me, uh, he, he begins to look like a startup founder or like one of these charismatic figures uh, in the world of technology uh, who emerge from time to time. Um, but it takes a while, right? He is not famous overnight. Uh, you know, this picture from 1930 shows uh, him with uh, a model of one of his earliest designs. Um, so uh, Fuller, Fuller could have focused on almost any field, you know, to make a mark as a futurist. Uh, and he chose architecture uh, in large part because, you know, that was a world to which he had access. And so his first proposals um, as an as a architectural theorist, let's say, um, involve a house that can be built in a factory. Fuller uh, at that point had been building uh, houses for you know this company Stockade that he founded you know for a long time. He was frustrated, I, I would say, by the slow pace of construction. You know, he he thinks of houses as you know as prototypes for production runs that never happen. And he says, you know, can we scale up? Can we produce houses at a bigger scale than before? And for him, this is almost a, a business problem. You know, he his 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 goal is to found a housing industry, you know, that one that would treat the house. In the same way, let's say that um, you know the telecommunications industry treats a single telephone, and, and this this is a very interesting you know visionary idea, um, but it comes before the design for the house itself. All right, so so Fuller wants to scale up. He wants to um, build a house that is um, light enough to be um, you know built in a factory and transported anywhere in the country. You know, that, that's a starting point. And from there, he actually arrives at certain design principles. Uh, so the house has to be light uh, because otherwise uh, transporting it would overwhelm the national trucking system, let's say. Um, and so Fuller arrives like fairly early on on a design for a house, um, again, based on the, the need for it to be lightweight and for it to be um, amenable to being scaled up on a factory level of you know what he calls the 4D house. So this is a house on a pole, as he calls it, that's hung on wires and, and made of materials like aluminum and, and plexiglass. Um, and it's based on tension rather than compression, you know, on materials that are designed to be stretched rather than compressed. Um, which allows you, you know, using those, you know, the right materials to, to build, um, you know, using letter, um, um, you know, sort of like the um, Instead of concrete aluminum, instead of um, you know these these heavy compression structures, you have light tension structures, um, which you know uh, obviously has certain practical uh, drawbacks as well. You know it, it works only at a large scale. You know these materials are expensive. Um, the design problems are difficult, and what you see here, this model, you know, is all that ever existed of this house. You know, Fuller never actually built the the, the entire thing, but he tried very hard. You know, he he would often, uh, in retrospect, depict himself as uh, sort of this detached developer of ideas. You know, who was only trying to get you know um, prototypes made or, or to do experiments, but you know, he he really did want to succeed as a businessman. Um, and you see him trying and failing repeatedly over the course of his life until he he eventually arrives at uh, what for him is a more viable model for how to get these things done. So instead of building uh, the house uh, for real, um, he has models and he also has um, projects that are essentially um, pieces of the house. All right. So on, on the left here, there's an image of Fuller in 1933 with uh, what is known as the Demaxian car. Demaxian, by the way, is one of Fuller's um, buzzwords. And it essentially means, um, you know, being the most efficient with the materials at hand. You know, this is this is a concept that Fuller is is publicly discussing, you know, around this time. So the Demaxian car, you know, this famous three-wheeled car that has this very striking streamlined shape. Um, you know, ha had certain drawbacks as a as a, a vehicle, a, as I discuss in the book. Um, but you know, to me, the relevant part here is, you know, why is Fuller developing a car? Right? He was talking about doing a house, and suddenly he switches to a car. And, and I think you know, Fuller saw the car as a piece of the house that could detach itself and drive away. You know, he referred to the uh, the car later as as a front porch on wheels. Um, and and you know, if you're going to build a house that is you know designed to be um, installed and occupied anywhere, you have to have a vehicle that uh, will go with it to allow occupants to to travel. And, you know, Fuller, uh, you know, said at the time that, uh, you know, this was the ground version of uh, or the ground taxiing version of a vehicle that he thought could eventually fly. Um, and obviously, this was not uh, feasible. 
Uh, but you know, the idea is very striking, and it kind of speaks to Fuller's interest at this stage in um, decentralization uh, and dispersion. You know, and, and what it looks like when you know you can have these small houses that can be built almost anywhere. And on the right, you know, is the Damaxian bathroom, uh, which is another uh, element that Fuller prototyped uh, at, at fairly small scale uh, early on. Uh, and again, this is a piece of the house, all right? Uh, Fuller is actually very interested in the utilities. Um, you know, he, he sort of uh, sees the house as um, being divided into like two parts. And this, this actually to me is a very interesting and, and powerful idea. So the house is uh, essentially uh, made uh, out of one, um, an outer shell, you know, which protects the occupant from the elements. And number two, uh, an internal utility core, um, you know, that contains things like the house, uh, the house's, um, you know, power sources, um, the kitchen, the bathroom. Um, and Fuller's big insight is that these two elements of the house can be treated separately. For the utility core, you can develop a compact um, kind of uh, unit that will um, provide the user with, uh, you know, all of the uh, the appliances and the utilities that they need. You know, Hilliard calls this the black box. And, and so this is something that you can engineer to be efficient in the way you'd engineer, um, you know, a plane bathroom or, or you know, um, uh, fixtures for uh, train cars, you know, which to him were uh, an important source of inspiration. And the second part of the shell, you know, the, the exterior shell, it can be an umbrella. It can be as light as possible. You know, this is the part that you can, you know, build based on tension um, design uh, elements um, because it doesn't need to be heavy um, to do its job. And so this the shell, you know, which will recur in various forms, um, you know, throughout uh, Fuller's career, uh, and ends up being easier to design than the utilities. Okay, this this is also an important point. You know, Fuller tries for years to design things like a bathroom, but you know, it never quite works um, in the way that he, he intends. And so you'll see, and, and this is this is a theme that should become apparent later on. You know, he eventually drops the utility core. He keeps the shell. You know, the shell becomes the basis for you know a lot of his designs. Um, and he kind of, you know, he, he on the sidelines, he never stops developing utilities. He's working on a, like versions of the bathroom, you know, up until almost the day he dies. Um, but for reasons that we'll see in a minute, you know, the, the shell part um, ends up being much more uh, feasible. And eventually he treats it as if it were, uh, if it had been his intention all along to, to focus entirely on the shell. So the first like um, actual a uh, house that he develops that um, one could actually live in is called the Damaxian Deployment Unit. And this is um, a house, this picture dates from around 1941. So this is after Fuller has done various other projects in the meantime. Uh, but th this is a house that is based on a grain bin. You know, th these are grain bins that were used uh, during the New Deal by farmers to store grain. And uh, Fuller was dri driving one day, actually in Illinois, uh, when he passed one and realized that it could be turned without a lot of trouble into a a prefab house, essentially. And so, you know, I, I would say a few dozen of these um, houses were built um, and acquired by uh, the U.S. Army Signal Corps, um, I believe, or maybe the, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it, they were acquired by the military. Uh, Fuller actually exaggerated the um, number of units that were, were sold. Um, they're, they're really only um, a, a very small run, but this was Fuller's first successful attempt to um, to build a house or to, to manufacture a house. And, and you know, it, it differs from the 4D house in, in obvious ways. Um, and an important one is that it, it's much simpler. You know, Fuller uh, kind of realizes that, you know, the the full scale Damaxian house of his dreams, you know, is gonna be very hard to, to engineer uh, at this stage. And so he settles for what I think of as almost the minimum viable product. All right, this is a grain bin. It is the shell. And, and you know, you could in theory buy a kerosene stove with some other, you know, appliances from Sears to fill out the inside. But, you know, it, it is just the shell, essentially. Um, because the shell is something that, you know, lets itself to the um, factory and industrial resources that Fuller has available to him in the early 40s. Um, and, uh, you know, surprisingly enough, you know, Fuller uh, around this time, you know, um, during and after World War II, uh, he actually does uh, come very close to doing this. Um, so this is an image of the Damaxian dwelling machine or what's called the Wichita House, which uh, Fuller built in Wichita, Kansas uh, uh, in 1946. 
So this is one of two prototypes that were built. Uh, this is an outdoor prototype, and there's another prototype that was built indoors. So there, there was no finished house. You know, both, both prototypes were incomplete. But you know, this was a house that he produced using an aircraft factory, and it is a wild house. It, it is a it is a striking design. Um, I should I should mention earlier, you know, too that uh, the 40 house was hexagonal uh, because it was designed to hang uh, from wires on a, um, from a central pole. Uh, the Maxian dwelling uh, machine is round. It looks like a like a flying saucer that is you know fallen into this uh, this field in Kansas. Um, and but you know like, like many of the principles that Fuller um, talks about you know the 20s are, are finally here you know in, in tangible form. You know it, it is a round house. It is built on tension structures out of aluminum and plexiglass. It hangs from you know a, a central core that um, is also you know the the location for the appliances, the kitchen, the bathroom. So this is, you know, incredibly close to the house that Fuller envisions. Um, he only makes two, or as I said, less than two uh, prototypes. Um, you know, it never goes into production uh, for various reasons um, that I, I cover in the book. Uh, you know, Fuller, on the one hand, was was difficult to work with. He actually resigned impulsively from the company that he had founded and then spent a year trying to reacquire control from the outside. So there was a, a corporate battle here. Um, and obviously, this was, you know, a design that was challenging. You know, even in the prototype form, there were still design issues that Fuller had trouble overcoming. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so so this is his best shot at building the house that he has envisioned since the, the late 20s, you know, this sort of quintessential Damaxian house, the house built in a factory. Um, and, you know, he never really comes close to this this again. Um, this is this is again this is in you know the the mid 40s. This is far from the end of Fuller's career. Um, but at this stage, you know, when he's 52 years old, um, and you know, at, at this point, you know, he he feels like a failure. Um, and and you know, more importantly, he is unlikely to ever get the kind of resources that he had uh, in the 40s again. You know, during and after the war was sort of this unique moment when someone like Fuller, you know, actually could get the resources of a full aircraft factory, let's say. Um, and, uh, you know, he 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 is aware that he might have lost his one chance um, at, at having, you know, like a like a, uh, you know, a factory operation on that scale. So what happens? Um, so so Fuller is interested in geometry. And, uh, you know, this has been a personal interest of his for years. And he he likes very hands-on geometry that, um, you know, involves models like sticks and string and and you know spheres that he can glue together at his kitchen table. Um, and so after after he is uh, after he loses control of the one company that um, you know could feasibly have built his house in, in a factory, he he falls back on geometry, and particularly he falls back on the dome. Um, so he starts to sketch out, you know, this, this figure here, which, um, you know, he describes as the uh, triangular intertension of the great circles of the ecosahedron. Um, so what, what does that mean? It, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a, a, a figure that he arrives at, you know, from his, um, document, his, his like, work on, uh, on geometry. And, you know, he notices, he notices one day that um, this shape uh, or at least, at least the upper half of the shape, um, the hemisphere, looks sort of like an enclosure. It looks like something you could build out of, let's say, um, metal strips um, and, and use it sort of as the the shell, as the umbrella that he has been thinking about for years. You know, he, he is primed to look for the shell. Um, and, you know, he tried to build the shell plus the utilities in Wichita. It didn't work. Uh, but, you know, this on paper looks like something he can prototype very easily. Uh, his his first designs uh, or his first uh, models are actually made from Venetian blind strips, um, you know. And, and the idea is that you know he does not need a factory operation to um, to build a, a version of the dome. He just doesn't have one. He, you know, he doesn't have access to this um, to, the, to those resources. So he's going to fall back and, and focus on a design that he could plausibly build using nothing but what he could get at a hardware store. And so he does uh, build or try to build domes. You know, this is a picture taken at Black Mountain College in North Carolina, where Fuller taught during the summer of 1948. And on the, on the ground, you can see um, a, a model of, uh, you know, the dome uh, that he has in mind. And then if you look more closely, you know, you'll see these uh, these strips of metal lying on the field. And, uh, you know, these are Venetian blind strips. These were the strips that he was hoping to use to build a 50-foot, uh, you know, in diameter 
uh, dome. And, and it fails. Um, you know, famously, um, the 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 blind strips are so flimsy that you know the the dome won't even stand up. Um, and you know, this so this is this is a failure. This this points to some of the challenges that Fuller has in building a dome. Um, as as I mentioned in the book, you know, he benefits enormously from having access to a talented uh, group of students. Uh, you know, first at Black Mountain, and then later at the uh, Institute of Design uh, here at Chicago. And the following year, you know, his students, uh, who he's essentially given this uh, problem as, you know, a, a design challenge, uh, they do build a dome. And, and you know, it, it's initially built in Chicago, and this, this picture was taken in the summer of 49 at Black Mountain. So this is a smaller dome, and which makes it, you know, more practical already. And it, it's based on, um, instead of the sort of the curved strips that Fuller had in mind, this is based on a uh, system of hubs and struts, which is, you know, very close to the kind of dome that um, you, you see later on. Um, but it works, you know, it, it is different from the design that Fuller envisioned, and this is sort of the first instance or, you know, a, a, an obvious instance of Fuller relying on the, the design skills of others. I, I think he assigned them to build, um, you know, this, this dome, and they solved the problems that Fuller had not been able to solve himself. Um, but it's, it's, it's functional, you know, it fully has potential, uh, you know, as a, as a structure. Um, you know, uh, the following year, um, one of Fuller's students, uh, Jeffrey Lindsay, builds this beautiful dome in Quebec in Canada, um, which, which gets the attention of, uh, you know, people in the, the design world. And, um, you know, so, so this is the beginning of, of, you know, this interesting late phase in Fuller's life where, where he is in his 50s. You know, he's already uh, failed in a you know, fairly public way with the, the Wichita house. Um, but, you know, he sort of sees the dome as a structure that, as I said before, you know, he can prototype, you know, with minimal resources. He can build this using um, college kids. You know, it doesn't um, require a factory. You know, at this point, Fuller, you know, is gradually moving away from the idea of uh, founding a conventional company and sort of founding what I I call a uh, a virtual corporation. You know, this is a this is a operation based on Fuller himself, these very simple geometrical ideas, and college students who who he has access to through his work as a lecturer, and so he can essentially you know design um, or assign a dome project to a group of students during a college seminar that lasts about six weeks, um, and then you know actually come up with like a a you know, viable prototype of, of you know, a, a structure, you know, during that period, which is um, you know, not true of a lot of other designs that, you know, he he has in mind. The dome is simple. The dome is based on geometry that is very adaptable. Um, and so, you know, those are its attractions. You know, this is a, a project that is within Fuller's means, you know, at, at this stage in his career. Um, and obviously it has limitations in a practical sense, okay, uh, it's the shell only uh, at this stage, which means that it's, um, you know, it's not a viable house. A house is not just the shell. The house requires appliances and utilities. Um, and so Fuller originally, um, you know, he focuses on uh, applications that require the shell alone. So famously, he worked with the U.S. Marines uh, to develop um, a dome that could be used as a an advanced base uh, for troops in the field. You know, it was light enough, uh, you know, as Fuller uh, demonstrates here, to be flown by helicopter. Um, but you know, again, like it, it was never actually used in in the field in the sense that Fuller envisioned. But um, you know, it, it, th this is this is a application that you can um, kind of get your head around. You can you can you can conceive of the dome being used in, in this way. Uh, the most famous and the most um, profitable application of the dome was actually the radome. So in the in the 50s, uh, you know, the US military installed antennas in the, the, um, the Arctic Circle uh, to watch for signs of a Soviet air attack. This was the distant early warning line. And these antennas required enclosures to protect them from the elements. And a dome for once was actually ideally suited to this, uh, this, this uh, application because you know, as a hemisphere, it enclosed the most space with the least material so it wouldn't interfere with, uh, with radio waves. Um, it could be built out of plastic, you know, so without with minimal metal parts, which was also important. And you know, the the curved surface of the dome resists resists the elements actually pretty well. You know, resists wind and snow snow loads. Um, so you know, for for once, you know, the dome actually is successful. This is the one project, uh, the Radome project, uh, developed again mostly by Fuller's associates uh, that actually ends up being profitable. Uh, for a little while, he he is earning you know good money for the dome, which which for him was was unusual. Um, but you know, he 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 you know he and his associates um, 
you know, are pursuing a certain kind of project. Um, you know, projects that seem to lend themselves to the dome's strengths. Uh, so, for example, auditoriums. You know, this is a beautiful aluminum dome uh, that was built by Kaiser in, in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1957. Um, things like pavilions. So uh, this is a picture of a uh, pavilion for a uh, trade fair that was held in uh, Afghanistan in 1956. Um, and this is a design that was actually um, commissioned by the U.S. Information Agency uh, because they had these trade fairs that were important sites of cultural exchange uh, during the Cold War. And, and you know, they, they just need a tent. You know, they need an enclosure, obviously, to show off these exhibits. Um, but the dome ends up being, you know, kind of iconic in, in its own right. You know, the, the dome excites people more than the exhibits on the inside. And so, you know, sort of the power of the dome as, as a symbol, as an image, you know, is becoming clear during this period. Uh, and it kind of culminates in the late 60s um, with the, uh, the the dome for um, the World Expo uh, in Montreal. Um, so this is, uh, you know, the Montreal Expo dome. Which, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, since Fuller's masterpiece, uh, in, in some ways correctly, uh, it's important to note that he did not actually design this dome. Um, and in fact, uh, when one of his colleagues, uh, Peter Chermayev, uh, proposed the idea of making a dome for this pavilion, you know, he said, you know, Peter, I'm so tired of being known as the dome man. So, so Fuller is rebelling against his most famous idea, you know. Um, Fuller... Uh, if asked, would say that the dome was just one example or one instantiation of his um, design philosophy. Uh, he has other ideas, other other designs that he actually, you know, finds in some ways more compelling than the dome, which succeeded, you know, number one because it was practical, because um, you know it was uh, it was amenable to being realized in the real world in ways that some of other some of Fuller's other ideas were not. And it was compelling. It was visually very compelling. You know, it looks like something out of science fiction, even though it's uh, something that you could build in your garage. So, so it succeeds for obvious reasons, but in some ways it succeeds beyond Fuller's um, intentions. You know, he, he wants to be known for other things. And, and, you know, as I said before, you know, he is not a, a practical businessman. He is someone who uh, is better at, at concept, conceptions and at, um, at big ideas than at actually following through and, and building things for real. So, you know, with the Montreal Expo Dome, if you look at, uh, you know, his career, for, and he has, you know, um, a lot coming up in his, his life, uh, you know, it, it starts to split off into different um, spheres, shall we say. Um, on the one hand, there's Fuller himself, who at this point, you know, has realized that he actually doesn't need to build things to be successful, you know, that his his persona, his his brand, if you will, um, is not dependent upon actual projects being completed. Um, you know, around this time in the 60s, you know, Fuller starts to rely more on lecturing um, and also on conceptual art to convey his ideas. You know, during uh, the early 60s, he proposes a dome over Manhattan, um, you know, this incredible megastructure, you know, designed to um, enclose, you know, part of a huge city. And uh, this this drawing by, by Fuller and his uh, colleague, um, uh, T.C. Uh, Howard, um, you know, is incredibly striking. Um, but what strikes me about it is that, you know, obviously this this had no chance of existing. You know, there's there no way a dome was going to be built, certainly at that stage, uh, over Manhattan. Um, and in some ways it was contrary to Fuller's philosophy of dispersion, you know, which which is interesting. But, you know, it's, it's an incredibly compelling image. Um, it got him attention, you know, from the press. You know, it was widely reproduced. And, and again, this is this is um, a design that is designed to only uh, exist in visual form. You know, it's never going to actually be built. Um, but the idea of the architect as the statement maker, as, as someone who is um, achieving their objectives through these um, radically ambitious-looking renderings. Uh, and they are renderings of megastructures. You know, Fuller is the first to do this, but not the last. You know, this is this is a trend that is often seen. These programmatic statements by architects. Um, so you know, like like these uh, these spheres, the cloud nines, which Fuller, uh, this this uh, artwork dates from around the same time. You know, it's by Fuller and his colleague uh, uh, Shoji Sadao. Um, but you know, these spheres that would float. You know, because they're full of air, and when it's warmed by the sun, it will naturally rise. And Fuller said that these could be used as uh, communities for people, as launching platforms for missiles. Um, 
and again, you know, a, a beautiful work of art um, that, again, I, I saw growing up, was very struck by, um, belongs to the realm of science fiction. But, uh, you know, with Fuller, you, you never knew, you know, if people were um, inclined to trust him when he said that these things were possible. He, you know, they, they were never actually built, but, you know, he, he can, again, he can get these points across uh, using art alone. Um, so this is Fuller's approach, you know, during during the late 60s, early 70s. Um, I, I should also mention that other people did build domes for real. Uh, you know, this is a, a picture from um, a publication called Dome Book, which dates from 1971, you know, and it's essentially designed to, um, uh, you know, give people the 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 tools and the um, information they need to build domes themselves. This is sort of the explosion of the dome and the counterculture uh, for various reasons. Um, you know, this is around the time of the rise of the commune. Um, you know, domes are famously used in, in places like Drop City in Colorado for, for housing. Um, and there's a tr there's a trend among like some people, some some hippies um, from this period to look for design solutions. You know, not everyone is looking for uh, political activism. Let's say you know as as a way to solve problems. Some like like Stuart Brand, the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog, or Lloyd Kahn, the founder of uh, of uh, Shelter and the Dome Book. You know, think that maybe design is the answer. And in Fuller, they find. Um, a role model in the dome, they find an incredible charismatic object. Um, and this is the community that later evolves into, uh, you know, the world that will produce the personal computer, you know, that will found Silicon Valley. Um, and a lot of the same impulses are visible here. Um, it's important that Fuller himself is not necessarily involved on this front. In fact, he, he actually um, is suspicious of people who are trying to use his ideas and, and disseminate them in this way. But you know, obviously, you know, a massively important part of his legacy and his influence that comes out of um, ideas that have, in some ways, taken on a life of their own. So, so Fuller, you know, again, like the last decade of his life, you know, he is a beloved figure um, to the counterculture. He is a famous intellectual, um, and then you know, he receives honorary degrees and awards because he embodies the future to people because the dome made him famous. Um, it dies in eighty three. And when he dies, um, you know, his, his legacy at that point is, is like a little bit diminished. You know, I think so much of what Fuller, you know, as I say before, you know, he, he left behind very few finished buildings. You know, he was not the architect, you know, um, for any of these structures. It's very hard to point to more than a, a handful of iconic domes, you know, that still survive that he was at all involved in. Um, and so, you know, his his reputation was based on his ideas, his presence, you know, his talks. He was such a, you know, charismatic figure um, that after he dies, you know, the the movement sort of goes away um, in, in ways, and you know, to an extent that I think Fuller would have been surprised by. Um, and you know, one question that you can ask now is, you know, why are these ideas relevant today? You know, the, the dome has obvious shortcomings as, as a shelter. Um, I, you know, there, there's, there's a reason why most of us don't live in dome houses. And, and Fuller was unable to to solve a lot of the problems that he he was looking at and trying to address. But he he is still relevant. Um, and, and I want to close uh, by by you know discussing one story which I love which talks it you know tells me a little bit about um you know why Fuller is still stud still worth studying so in 1985 at Rice University in Texas um a team of scientists uh, was trying to identify a new uh, kind of carbon that they had sort of stumbled across in the lab and um they realized that you know this new kind of carbon you know probably uh had 60 carbon atoms each molecule had 60 atoms and it was probably enclosed because the molecules were very stable. And eventually they start talking about the possibility of a sphere. And one of them says, so who is that guy who built all those domes? Um, you know, so they go to the library, they get one of Fuller's books, they, they look at the pictures of domes. Um, later that night, one of them gets the idea that um, this, uh, this molecule could be a sphere made up out of 12, um, uh, pentagons and 20 hexagons, which he builds out of paper, you know, in his, his living room and then brings to the lab the next day. So this is, and, th and this is the correct structure. Now the structure I've just described, you know, it's, it's known as a truncated icosahedron um, and it appears uh, in uh, some of Fuller's patents, uh, you know, as, as I depict to the left here. Um, and so this, this molecule that uh, was developed uh, or discovered at Rice becomes known as uh, Buckminster Fuller-Reed uh, or the Buckyball. 
Um, and and it's an homage to Fuller. It's, I think it's one that he deserves. Uh, I think his ideas were were crucial in the discovery of uh, the Fullerenes, uh, which have, have since you know uh, I mean other forms have been discovered, and um, you know the applications uh, for for um, Mr. Fullerene, you know, uh, still a work in progress, um, but still um, a massively important discovery um, that Fuller uh, deserves. I mean, not credit, obviously, but you know, his his ideas informed that work in meaningful ways. Um, I, I think it's actually extraordinary, you know, um, you know, how useful uh, that geometry can be. Um, and you know, Richard Smalley, who, uh, along with two other members of his team, you know, won the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, for um, for chemistry for for the discovery. Um, you know, talked about how. Uh, you know, Buckminster Fullerene, you know, might have been used to form, you know, some of the very first, um, like, uh, molecules in the universe. Um, I want to close with a quote from Smalley, which I think uh, captures some of what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to convey about Fuller here. Smalley uh, writes, uh, if Fullerenes have been present in interstellar space in large enough quantities, they could have provided the first real surfaces in the universe. Molecules could accrete around C60 to form the first dust balls. Dust balls could form large rocks. Rocks could form asteroids, comets, and planets, as well as new stars. How fitting if the geodesic shape that provides such flexible stability to modern man-made structures also turns out to have helped build the very first solid things. Buckminster Fuller would have loved it. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, so that concludes my um, uh, formal, uh, you know, uh, remarks. Um, and uh, at this point, you know, if people have questions, um, you know, Fuller's life is so complex and there's so much to cover that I very rarely have a chance to, you know, talk about everything. You know, it's it's impossible to do that, um, you know, in, in one sitting. So if there are particular projects or episodes or, or ideas that people find interesting, you know, please let me know. I, I would love to, to answer uh, as many questions as possible. Thank you, Alec. That was a really fascinating presentation about a really fascinating human being. Do you know about uh, Fuller's relationship with Japan? Have you heard of, for example, the architect Osamu Ishiyama? I'm sorry, I missed the name. Could you say it again? Osamu Ishiyama. Um, you know, I, I don't actually. Uh, I, I I I have not explored that that question. Um, cool. So, go go ahead. Well, well, Fuller was invited to speak in Tokyo, uh, I think in the late 60s, or early 70s, mm -hmm. uh, at Waseda University. And, uh, and yet the young Ishiyama was in the audience and, and uh, I think chaperoned uh, Fuller around Tokyo at some point, was very interest, interested in his philosophy. And then a few years later, he made a visit to the US, uh, Ishiyama did, where he picked up a copy of the Dome Cookbook uh, and brought it back to Japan and built a house that he called the Atsumi Pear Dome, which was two paired geodesic domes, very small ones, domestic scale, uh, as an homage to um, Fuller. Uh, they leaked very badly. He, um, he wrote a letter uh, uh, to the editors of the Dome Cookbook complaining that he followed the instructions perfectly, but the dome leaked. And uh, yeah. some later he got a reply saying, please enjoy the rain. But uh, <laughs> I think that um, uh, there's another architect who, uh, and then um, uh, Ishiyama himself, he was very interested by the, the influence by the Wichita house, and he built his own houses out of uh, large steel pipes, large steel culverts, although he mm -hmm. placed them horizontally so they became tubes that you could inhabit rather than drums that you would live inside. But uh, as you mentioned in the book, um, you, I think you say that uh, Fuller's most enduring concept is that of ephemeralization of the shift from uh, solid to uh, insubstantial uh, effects, let's say, from, from physical to digital or virtual or conceptual. And uh, I, I, he was always trying to make uh, buildings and structures as light as possible. So one of the intentions of the geodesic, geodesic dome was to make a building that weighed as little as possible. And uh, he, I, I believe he was once asked, I think you mentioned it in your book, what comes out of the dome? And he said, nothing at all, an electromagnetic field. And there's an architect, a uh, contemporary of Ishiyama called Toyo Ito, who in fact has spent uh, much of his career looking at the virtualization of architecture, trying to make it as light and uh, ephemeral as possible. So ephemer ephemerality was also a key concept in the work of Ito, although as far as I know, he's never mentioned the influence of Buckminster Fuller on his thinking. But certainly um, uh, Fuller's uh, innovations with regard to materials, structures, and um, 
uh, energy usage have had a big influence here. We have, a, in fact, a professor here at Tokyo University who's very interested in tensegrity, which I don't believe was invented by Philip, but certainly was something he uh, looked into, promoted, and uh, worked on it. So That's right. Well, um, we have a number of people in the audience. Uh, some are online. So if you're online, feel, please feel free to put in a question in the chat. Uh, but first of all, I'll ask if anyone in the room here tonight has any questions. First of all, thank you for your presentation. And um, when you showed us that vehicle, the three-wheel vehicle, um, is it how the RV started? The camping vans? Is it like a futuristic vision for them, or they actually existed before that? Um, so the so the um, the Damascene car. Um, it's interesting because it does sort of resemble like a classic Airstream trailer, which uh, which Fuller um, actually occupied for a long time. Um, and the answer is that you know it is not actually anticipate that um, kind of structure because uh, I mean th these are large cars. You know I think they were 11, 19 feet long, nineteen feet long. You know um, you know at their at their longest. Um, you know, but they weren't they were designed to be uh, occupied. All right. Um, but, you know, you actually raise a very interesting question because Fuller is obsessed by the idea of mobile housing. Um, you know, I, I mentioned before he lives in a trailer like this. And one of his um, earlier uh, concepts is for something that um, he calls uh, the, the autonomous dwelling unit. And it's basically like a trailer you could attach to your car that would contain the kitchen and the bathroom and all the utilities you would need that you could drive to campsites or, you know, um, in so let's say an evacuation evacuation scenario, you know, it could be used to provide, you know, everything that a family needed, you know, in, in a small space. So, yeah, so this is something that obsesses him, um, you know, and and I don't think, um, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with the concept, uh, you know, prior to, you know, Fuller's time. Um, but it's certainly one that he explored repeatedly. You know, he he didn't necessarily develop like mobile homes uh, per se, but the idea of combining you know uh, the utilities with a uh, house or with a with a structure that could be transported um, either under its own power or by something like helicopter, you know, is something that he um, you know explores for decades. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Oh, yes, we have some questions from uh, some of our online audience. Can you read this up? So the question is, you know, could I elaborate a little bit on um, the use of technology in relation to sustainability, which is a great question. Um, so, so Fuller, you know, very early on, one of Fuller's um, central concepts is doing more with less. And originally, this comes out of his desire to build a house in a factory, which which has certain uh, pragmatic technical requirements. You know, it needs to be light. And so, doing more with less, at first, is a, a practical means to an end. It, it's it's the design approach that will allow him to build the house he wants. Uh, and then later on, you know, he correctly sees efficiency, you know, doing more with less ephemeralization as a desirable end in itself. And originally, this is an economic argument. Um, you know, it's it's one that is based on the need for uh, architects and engineers to, you know, to, to find efficient ways of solving problems. Um, and then later, it, it does sort of shade into a theme of sustainability, you know, the idea that um, we have enough uh, in the world, we have enough resources and wealth in the world to provide for everyone, and we don't. And, you know, this is a part of a political problem, but for, for Fuller, it was a design problem. You know, he basically said that if um, we found more efficient ways of using the resources and the renewable energy that we have, you know, we, we should be able to figure out a way to, you know, make the world work and provide for everyone. And this is a theme that... Um, is in his work as early as the mid thirties, let's say late thirties, certainly by the time he writes the book, nine chains to the moon. Um, but you know, what I find interesting about sustainability and sort of Fuller's view uh, on it is that it kind of is minimized during certain parts of his career, you know, in the early fifties, let's say he's going after military clients, he's going after corporate clients, you know, uh, who are not going to be moved necessarily by the idea of providing for all of mankind using more efficient technology. 
but then as these audiences and these clients, you know, become um, harder for Fuller to find, he uh, returns to the message of providing for all people. And I think a large part of this is that he is learning to appeal to college students. You know, these are students who are more likely to be motivated by, um, you know, uh, the, the more altruistic goal, shall we say, of, 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 you know, providing for everyone. And so this message becomes more prominent in his uh, thinking during the 60s. Um, and so there's a shift here in, in sort of, you know, his vision for himself and for, you know, the ends to which this technology can be put. Um, but you know, obviously, this is an important goal, and, and and Fuller's ideas have been appropriated or and adopted by environmentalists, you know, you know, for for good reason. Um, I'm not sure I would describe Fuller as an environmentalist. I, I think he is someone who saw sustainability as a practical goal. You know, he he understood that, um, you know, we we did need to you know make more efficient use of our resources, but you know, to serve humanity. Um, you know, his, his most famous metaphor is Spaceship Earth, which, you know, as many critics have pointed out, is a mechanistic analogy. You know, it kind of sees the the Earth, or at least frames the Earth, as a mechanical object um, that is essentially there to serve humanity, to serve the human, the human race. Um, you know, his, his attitude towards other elements of the environment, you know, and, and of uh, ecological thinking, you know, were a little bit... Um, Inconsistent, shall we say? Uh, but, but certainly, you know, because of his obsessions and these needs he had to develop efficient materials, Fuller left people with an incredible um, legacy of ideas and um, material on sustainability and, and, you know, sort of how that ties into, you know, the idea of uh, technological progress. All right, I think I have a question here. Um, all right, and one more question. Uh, Yes, so this is a great question. Um, so uh, this is about um, the metabolists. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. You know, this movement in Japan, um, you know, that uh, actually my friend Casey Mack uh, recently published a, a, um, a book on, and it says, uh, it asks whether, the, you know, the, the metabolists also use on numerous occasions organic structures for their projects. Do you think it is related or uh, is it due to a general interest of the time? Um, I think I think it's more likely to be the latter. I, I am not familiar with a direct uh, line of influence from Fuller to these groups. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm actually not that familiar with uh, with their work in detail. Um, but I will say the use of organic structures is a obvious um, theme in the architecture from this period. Uh, and in Fuller, you know, I'll speak to him because I know more about him. Um, it was sort of inadvertent. You know, he arrives at the dome through geometry. Um, he is not, as far as I know, or as far as anyone has been able to establish, directly inspired by natural structures. Um, later on, he notices that there are parallels between geodesics and, um, you know, certain organic structures. It ends up being very useful in virology uh, to describe the structure of, of, cell vi uh, of virus shells. Um, but Fuller is, is, is very wary of saying that he was inspired by nature. Uh, I think Fuller prefers to present himself as someone whose ideas come from um, other sources, uh, you, know, or, you know, come from within himself. And he is, he is reluctant to credit other sources, even, you know, if it's something as simple as the natural world. You know, he says that, you know, a fly's eye would collapse if it were, you know, used in the way that, you know, I envision it, that, you know, I had to, to arrive at these geometrical solutions to problems that maybe nature uh, independently arrived at. Um, you know, nature does build. Uh, Fuller would say, uh, using triangles, you know, not 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 squares, and using the, the tetrahedron, the four-sided pyramid, you know, and not uh, the cube. You know, and, and this is part of his argument. This is part of um, the body of ideas he leaves behind. But but yeah, I, I should I should clarify that you know Fuller, um, when asked if he had been inspired by nature, he would say no. Um, you know, in, in some ways, as if it were he, uh, if he were afraid that nature would take credit uh, from him. Um, in, in the way that other people, you know, uh, he, he feared would. Thank you for your uh, wonderful lecture. And I have a question. Uh, Fuller's idea was to use the least amount of resources to benefit the most of the people. And also he uh, invited the structure about the dome, uh, which made it possible to make a very uh, big and high space without any support. The structure can uh, support by itself. So 
uh, and Fuller has lots of other uh, ideas and inventions. And now in the modern, uh, in uh, nowadays, lots of um, uh, scientists and uh, businessmen are starting to think to do the Mars uh, colonization for the future uh, to solve a lot of problems we are facing on Earth. So what do you think we can learn from Fuller's life or what uh, Fuller's idea or technology can be used in, uh, in, study, uh, in maybe Mars colonization or uh, build uh, space stations on Moon? Thank you. Thank you. You know, the, the, that's a good question because it, it kind of ties into something that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, so, uh, I mean, Elon Musk obviously is the person who comes to mind when you talk about, you know, colonizing Mars. And, and I think Musk and Fuller are actually very similar in certain ways. I, I think that the um, persona that Musk actually had until recently, uh, shall we say, and, um, you know, sort of his, his um, you know, the, the, the appeal that he holds to to certain people still, you know, it's, it's very similar to Fuller, you know, um, uh, Jérôme Lanier, the um, virtual reality um, uh, sort of pioneer, uh, told me that, you know, he felt that Fuller had been um, famous during his time in the way that someone like Musk is now. Um, and there's, there's, you know, there are obvious parallels there. I mean, I mean, there, there are differences, obviously, you know, Fuller did not become the world's richest man. Um, and I think Musk's reputation has, has evolved a little bit in ways that Fuller is, has not, you know, in part for that reason. Um, but I do think that Fuller is, you know, interesting because he he is a source of inspiration for, for people like Musk. You know, I, I don't know if Musk has talked about Fuller, you know, um, in particular, but you know, certainly like the example that he left behind, you know, perhaps transmitted through intermediaries like Steve Jobs, you know, has really affected how people like Musk um, talk about themselves and, and present themselves. Um, and so I have no doubt that Fuller's ideas will continue to be referenced. Um, in you know some of these uh, attempts, um, the, these projects we've talked about, but you know it, it's also important to note that you know these ideas are powerful as, as metaphors and not necessarily as um, practical solutions. And, and I have one good example, which is that Musk has occasionally talked about uh, using geodesic domes on Mars to house you know that first generation of Martian colonists. And, and you know you see domes in movies like The Martian, uh, you know, and, and Foundation and you know other other science fiction series. Um, but the you know I, I'm not convinced the dome is actually a good choice for uh, a Mars colony. You know, I think the, the dome has issues, it, it leaks, you know, as, as people would say uh, or have pointed out, it's hard to expand, it's hard to modify, you know, I, I'm not sure I would trust a, a crew of, of, of colonists to that structure. Um, and I think any practical look at that problem would probably come to the same conclusion. Um, so why is the dome often mentioned in, um, you know, coverage of, uh, you know, Mars colonies or, or you know, movies uh, or, or you know, simulations? And, and the answer is that it looks futuristic. The answer is that the dome because it has this uh, triangulated structure, you know, that's very, you know, based on geometry, you know, it excites people visually, you know, and kind of viscerally, you know, even though, as I said, you know, the actual design itself is very simple. And so you see the dome used in science fiction, you see it in a lot of, you know, illustrations from, you know, novels and magazines in this period, and movies and TV shows, as I said, and occasionally in more serious proposals. And, and I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, is this because the dome is actually the best and most efficient structure to use, you know, on, on a Martian colony? Or is it because the dome reminds us of Martian colonies and makes us think about the future in ways that have, um, you know, almost nothing to do with, with its actual um, practical benefits? Well, thank you, Alec. I think we're at the end of the time here. Uh, and I'm sure it's about to be dawn in Chicago and you need to get some sleep. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for getting up so early in the morning or staying up so late at night for us. An amazing presentation. It's a brilliant book. I, uh, I read it over the New Year break. Uh, and uh, he's an endlessly fascinating person. And I admire you for being someone who's found a way to combine your science fiction interests with the kind of leading edge of uh, real world technology uh, that we're, we're, um, it kind of blends into science fiction in a sense. So thank you for your time and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Uh, yes, thanks so much. I, I would love to come back.